to do when it's happening and to prepare for it beforehand. Uh, one of the most important things we'll be doing is an actual drop, cover, and hold drill at 1017. People around the world will be doing this, and Lucy Jones will guide us through it. And if you're thinking, wow, that feels uncomfortable to me to be doing that with my colleagues in this room, well, it's my first time too, so it's going to feel weird for me. And if you're thinking, I'm not dressed for that, well, unless you're at the gym during the earthquake, you're probably not going to be dressed for it. Um, <laughs> if you're in the shower, you're really not going to be dressed for it. <laughs> so, um, my lovely assistant, Atticus, please stand up. He's going to demonstrate. It's going to be hard to see him, but he's going to quickly demonstrate, because uh, he's been taught this in school, that you drop to the... Oh, wait, first, Atticus, how are you going to know if an earthquake is coming? Because it's going to start shaking. It's going to start shaking. That's your clue. So when it starts shaking, what do you do? You drop under the closest desk, table, or chair. You cover your neck and head, and then you hold. Now, I thought hold meant stay in place until the shaking stops. Hold actually means hold on to the leg of the table or chair, and Lucy will explain why. And then, Atticus, when do you get out from under there? When the shaking stops. When the shaking stops. And there might be aftershocks. Thank you, Atticus. Um, and, and we'll get out from under there when Lucy tells us to. I just want to note for safety, uh, these tables have been kind of, they're on hinges. And so the hinge that is vertical is not stable. Uh, so don't, if you lean against it, it might move. Um, and so, uh, let's see. So our first speaker will be Doug Toomey. And he's a professor of geophysics here at UVO and is a pioneer in the use of ocean bottom seismology to explore tectonic uh, plate boundaries. He's also the director of the Oregon Hazards Lab and principal investigator for the Oregon components of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, Shake Alert, and Alert Wildfire. So what I love about this is he's working on uh, two totally different hazards but using uh, some of the same technology, which is very cool. Uh, Professor Toomey and his team have led a push for additional onshore and offshore earthquake monitoring stations to be incorporated into a full West Coast earthquake early warning system. So thank you for your work on that. Uh, after Professor Toomey, we will hear from internationally renowned seismologist Dr. Lucy Jones, who is here uh, this month as our Wayne Morris Chair for Law and Politics. Um, she has been a research associate at Caltech since 1984 and has published more than 100 uh, research papers on seismology. She completed 33 years of federal service with the U.S. Geological Survey um, and was leading USGS's long-term science planning for natural hazards research nationally to get the nation more prepared. And she's the founder of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society with a mission to foster the understanding and application of scientific information in the creation of more resilient communities. In other words, when our community prepares, she's trying to help make sure that policymakers are actually taking the science into account, uh, which is important. She's been a prominent public uh, voice on the science of earthquake and natural disaster and has done thousands of interviews. Um, if there's, you know, for the next earthquake, if you click on your phone, the live stream will be of Lucy. Uh, live recording the earthquake. <laughs> yeah, there were actually earthquakes in San Francisco while she was here, and I think the Caltech Seismology Lab was very nervous they did not have her on hand. Um, after the drop, cover, and hold drill, we'll hear from Krista Dillon, who serves as Director of Operations for U of O Safety and Risk Services. And in that role, she manages the Emergency Management and Continuity Program. We do have one. Thank you for doing that uh, here at U of O, as well as a number of interdisciplinary teams, including the Incident Management Team, Campus Vulnerability Assessment Team, Behavioral Evolution and, uh, Evaluation and Threat Assessment Team, and the Demonstration Team. So thank you. She's the one who's up at night a lot, uh, worrying about what might happen on campus and how to help us uh, be prepared for it and be safe. Finally, we will have questions and answers at the end. So uh, I give you Professor Toomey, and thanks for being here today. Well, thanks, Rebecca, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to speak before.
poor Lucy, and I'm glad I'm gone before her because <laughs> she's such a great public speaker. So, uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is about the uh, Oregon Hazards Lab in the Pacific Northwest, and particularly the Cascading Subduction Zone. And as Rebecca said, we're working on two of the hazards. Can I move this out so I can see the screen? Yes. You can also twist it. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, the Oregon Hazards Lab, as Rebecca said, is where the, uh, the principal uh, people running the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network here in the state of Oregon. We're involved in Shake Alert, the West Coast Wide Earthquake Early Warning System, and I'll explain to you what that is and what its benefits are to society in the, along the West Coast. We're also involved in Alert Wildfire, and our goal is to build out a multi hazards research platform called the Oregon Research Platform. We have a number of other partners on the U of O campus that we're coordinating with. And it's an excellent opportunity to uh, build out an infrastructure that can do a number of things throughout our state to benefit society. This is the Oregon Public Health Hazard Vulnerability Assessment. And along the vertical axis is the five-year hazard probability, with higher up being more likely that that event is going to occur. And along the horizontal axis is the public health consequences with, on the far right-hand side, overwhelming the system in terms of the public health consequences. So our group has decided to work on the two of the extremes of this. Um, today we're here because of the great shakeout, which Lucy began. Uh, we're interested in the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake and tsunami, and it's a rare event in the Pacific Northwest, but it's one that is so regionally devastating that it happens to impact all the infrastructure throughout the region. And so that's... Uh, rare but particularly overwhelming problem. We're also working on an event that, as many of us know here, except for this past summer, which was like a summer a decade or two ago, but I'm sure we all remember what two or three summers uh, ago felt like. And fire is a persistent problem throughout the Pacific Northwest and certainly throughout California now, and it's affecting our public health and it's affecting our economy. And so we're very interested in using technology, which I won't speak about today, but it's using the backbone that supports the Shake Alert system to put out mountaintop pan filter zoom cameras so we can do early fire detection and suppression. What I'd like to do in the majority of this talk is give you an outline of earthquake hazards in the Pacific Northwest and turn you all into amateur seismologists. And we'll discuss three earthquake threats and the intensity and, shake, uh, intensity and duration of shaking. And I'll finish off by describing Shake Alert what it is, when it will be available. I uh, briefly mentioned some of the pilot projects we have throughout the state, and I'd like to point out that Lucy Walsh, who's up here in front, is our uh, user engagement specialist for the state of Oregon. She's developing many of these pilot projects, including one here on the campus for the power system. So if you're ever interested in how we're impacting the public, uh, Lucy holds up her hand. She's the one. Um, so I think all of us know where it lies, but I want to make sure you do. The Cascadia Subduction Zone exists from the Mendocino, Cape Mendocino, or what we call in, in geophysics the Mendocino Triple Junction, where the San Andreas Fault ends, and it extends northward all the way up to Vancouver Island. And it's a very long fault, approximately 1,100 kilometers or 600 miles in length. Where it's locked, or where it's actually storing up strain and will be released, lies primarily offshore. And that's actually a good thing for the built infrastructure since, since much of our built infrastructure is along the I-5 corridor. And so we have the benefit that the earthquake is more distant from us, though it is regionally quite extensive. I want to say a little bit about earthquake hazards. Uh, when plate tectonics was discovered all the way up until the 1980s, the Cascade subduction zone was not recognized as a subduction zone capable of magnitude 9 earthquakes. And this map explains it to some, some degree. What are shown are epicenters in orange and green. And the green ones occur in the crust of the North American plate. And the orange ones occur in the subducting oceanic plate either offshore or as it goes beneath North America, it occurs within that plate as it goes underneath us. And one of the odd things about the Cascade subduction zone is all along, the lock zone, there's almost no seismicity. So globally, this is particularly odd. All the other subduction zones have magnitudes threes, fours, five, six, and seven, the occasional eight, and the, uh, even more occasional nine. But ours is remarkably quiet, and part of that is, well, A, we don't know, but B, we suspect it's largely related to we're subducting a very young, hot plate, and that changes the physical 
uh, properties and the thermal structure of that plate. Uh, so we know historically, not historically, but from the geologic record and from the, uh, the uh, stories of the Native American Indians, that there was an event in 1700. But unfortunately, uh, we have very little seismicity along it that would allow us to understand it better. We actually have three types of earthquake threats in the Pacific Northwest. So when you feel an earthquake and you duck, cover, and hold on, one of the things I want you to do is be able to understand, as you're underneath the desk, what type of earthquake you are experiencing. So the three types of earthquakes we have are crustal earthquakes. People probably remember the Klamath Falls earthquakes or the uh, Mount Angel earthquake up near Woodburn, both occurring in the 1990s. We have deep focus earthquakes, and then we have the Cascadia subduction zone. I'd like to go through each of those. Crustal earthquakes, how many people felt the July 4th, 2015 earthquake in Walterville? Uh, it felt like what? A truck driving down the road. Yep. And in, in our house, it was like a, you know, pow, it hit. Actually, I didn't recognize it as an earthquake. It was so fast. <laughs> uh, so it was a magnitude 4.2 that occurred out in Walterville. And when you feel an earthquake and you duck, cover, and hold on, I suggest starting to count. You know, one, 1,000, two, 1,000. It'll give you something to do besides worrying about what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> And you're collecting important data for yourself. These crustal earthquakes have a duration of seconds to at most tens of seconds. So if you're under the desk and you're counting, you go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, and it stops, you know that's not the really big one. And so you can get back up and go about your business, hopefully. The next type of earthquake are deep focus earthquakes. These occur primarily at depths of 40 kilometers, the shallow earthquakes. I didn't say, but I hope you read it, occur at relatively shallow depths, and they occur in the crust. These deep ones occur in the subducting plate. So here's a cross section through the Earth, with the surface of the Earth being here at zero, moving down in depth. And this cross section is taken with this purple box near Seattle, and the black circles show the epicenters of earthquakes for deep focus events. These are ones that are occurring within the plate as it goes beneath North America. These events can be up to magnitude seven. They occurred in 1945, 1965, and a 2001 Nisqually event. And I happened to be on a phone with a good friend and colleague at the University of Washington during that event. And I could hear his office as he said, that's an earthquake. And he put his phone down, and he went under his desk and duck cover and held on. And the filing cabinets were going back and forth, and things were falling down. And after you know a few uh, seconds to tens of seconds, he got up, and he said, and his British accent very calmly, I think I'll go now and call my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but he counted, and so an event like that, that was pretty devastating in the Squally area. It caused a couple billion dollars worth of damage, and people can lose their lives in those events. But they're not something that regionally overwhelms the system. Okay. So again, duck cover, hold on, and count. These events can be large, and if it ends in a tens of seconds, that's not the really big one. So the one we're most concerned about in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, all these earthquakes are problematic. If you're in Klamath Falls in a crustal event, you're in a building that has a problem. It's going to hurt you, but it's not going to overwhelm the system. Similarly, the deep focus events can have a larger impact in terms of the geographic footprint. But the subduction zone event going throughout the entire region is a completely different beast altogether. As I said earlier, it lies primarily offshore. It occurs in this small section of the lock zone. It primarily exists from the continental shelf outwards. It extends from Northern California to Vancouver <coughs> Island, and the duration of shaking can be up to four to five minutes. The duration of very intense shaking will be shorter, and I'll try and explain to you what you might feel during those events. But in terms of shaking that you would feel, it can last for many, many minutes. So if you're under your desk and you're counting and you've gotten over 100 seconds, then that's certainly a subduction zone earthquake that occurred in Cascadia. One of the things I should point out is you're on the coast and that event occurs, you have 10 to 15 minutes before a tsunami arrives. So, you know, stay calm and think about how you're going to evacuate in that case. 50 year probabilities. Scientists talk about probabilities. I'll talk about a magnitude 9 scenario in a few minutes, but we have to talk about probabilities of when an event might occur in a certain time window. So, in the next 50 years, the probability of a magnitude 9 event occurring 
along cascading, a magnitude 9 has to occur along the entire length of the fault. That's roughly 10 to 20 percent is our best estimate at the moment. Southern Cascadia has a probability of a mag between a magnitude 8 and a magnitude 9 of 25 to 40 percent in the next 50 years. And I would like to point out that if a magnitude 8 occurs in Southern <coughs> Cascadia, you may feel here in Eugene that it won't be devastating to our built infrastructure. We're far enough away that it would be felt but not problematic for us. It would be very difficult for Southern Oregon, Northern California, and the coastal regions. So it's important not to inflate a magnitude 8 with a magnitude 9. The difference in energy between an 8 and 9 is about 30 times. Okay. The shallow, uh, the deep uh, earthquakes, magnitudes greater than 6.5, those are the ones that are most likely going to occur in the next 50 years. And they historically have occurred in the Seattle Puget Sound area, but they've also occurred throughout the Cascadia subduction zone. And the shallow crustal earthquakes, uh, also up to magnitude 6.5 or so, 15% uh, chance in the next 20 to 50 years. So the USGS, which we used to work for, makes national seismic hazard maps. And I showed, I'll show you a blow up of this in a minute, but I want you to point out, I want to point out to you that we're not in the region of the greatest likelihood to exceed uh, a certain amount of ground acceleration in the next 50 years. So the color scale here, I'll, I'll give it to you in intensity in a few minutes, but this is in factors of G, how much vertical acceleration there is. Okay. And you can see that there are redder areas in the central U.S. and certainly along the San Andreas Fault, and we have a high probability of exceeding a certain uh, ground motion along southern Cascadia. Uh, but at the 2% exceedance in the next 50 years, yeah, we have some threat, but it's not the worst in the, in, the, in the entire U.S. And the reason I point that out is that we have a chance to build out our infrastructure so that it's more resilient. Hopefully the earthquake doesn't happen today or the next couple of years, but sometime off in the future. And so we act towards protecting ourselves and protecting our infrastructure. This is a similar map. This is the 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. Why make it so complicated? Uh, partly because you're building buildings and you're an engineer, you want to know what the ground shaking is going to be, and you want to make your buildings sort of 98% of the time they're going to survive something. But I'm also showing you this so I can flip it around that way. There's a 98% chance in the next 50 years you're not going to feel this ground shaking. So if you're all freaked out about the Cascadia subduction zone and earthquake, calm down a little bit. It could happen tomorrow, it could happen sometimes off in the future. And the current probability are that in the next 50 years, you have a 2% chance of, of feeling this amount of intensity and a 98% chance of not. That doesn't mean don't do anything. That means that we have to start rebuilding our infrastructure so that we can survive, just like Japan and Chile have survived their earthquakes. So, what if a magnitude 9 occurred? But with the, uh, discuss scenarios in a minute, but this is the 2% chance of exceeding this uh, shaking in the next 50 years. And maybe you've read this already, but in the Eugene Springfield area, we're at a modified mercalli intensity of about 7 or 8. And 7 says very strong, damage, negligible in buildings of good design and construction, slight to moderate and well built ordinary structures, considerable damage and poorly built. 8, damage slight. In specially designed structures, considerable damage in ordinary substantial buildings with partial collapse. I don't have my house bullet to the foundation yet. It's a wooden house. I don't expect it to be pan pancake, but I actually don't expect it to be on the foundation afterwards either. So one of the things you can do in terms of preparing yourself, and maybe Chris will talk about some of those, I know she'll talk about some of those things, but at your home, if you're really interested in preserving your home, there are resources out there to do that. I want to say that Oregon's been very proactive. Uh, in 2013, after a decade of magnitude 8s and 9s that occurred around the globe, there was a real push by a group of volunteers, the Oregon Seismic Safety Panel Advisory Committee, and they published the Oregon Resilience Plan, which if you Google, you can go find online. It's a very extensive document, and it deals with a magnitude 9 scenario. And a scenario is different from a probability. It says, if this is a magnitude 9, here's what you can expect for the built infrastructure. I personally think it's an excellent document, and it's been visionary for the state to do that. 
More recently, Governor Kate Brown published last fall Resiliency 2025, Improving Our Readiness for the Cascadia Earthquake and Tsunami. And in that, she has six plans to try and improve the readiness, and she's still seeking funding for that. And one of those is to build out a multi-hazard alerting system for the state. So I think the state of Oregon's trying to be very proactive in doing things. In the Oregon's Resilience Plan, you can find maps like this, where it shows um, this particular earthquake scenario and the impact zones, and the coastal zone is where the tsunami zone is going to occur. Um, there's, well, first of all, the tsunami zone, the coastal zone, and the valley zone. And, uh, and I'll simply point out that uh, in the valley, um, there'll be widespread and moderate damage, which would severely disrupt daily life in commerce. Um, I think it's important to say it might not look like Armageddon, but it might be very painful for the days, weeks, months, and years afterwards because we all treat the supermarket like our refrigerator. Our water uh, may not be serviceable. The fuel may not be available. So pay attention when Krista talks because preparing yourself to be multiple weeks ready is the real key. Uh, I think many of us here in Eugene will survive the earthquake, but the days, weeks, and months, and years afterwards are really the issue that we have to focus on. There's also maps in there like this for damage potential. You can take a look at that. It's very similar to what I showed you earlier. It talks about light shaking out here in the yellow areas, moderate shaking in the orange, or, and moderate to heavy shaking as you go to coastal regions. Okay, I want to finish off by talking about what ShakeAlert is and hand it over to Lucy. Uh, ShakeAlert is a West Coast-wide earthquake early warning system. It's developed by the USGS, Caltech, UC Berkeley, University of Washington, and the University of Oregon. And this can provide warning times of seconds to many tens of seconds, uh, depending on where you are with respect to the earthquake that occurs. So uh, it works very simply. When an earthquake happens, there are two types of waves that travel outwards. One is a P wave that travels quickly and it's not damaging. And we use that to quickly locate the earthquake, estimate its size, and send a warning to people more distance before the strong shaking arrives, and that's the S wave. Seismologists are very creative. The P wave is the primary wave. The S wave is the secondary wave. <laughs> All right. And so the idea is that if an earthquake happens, hopefully you, you're distant from the epicenter and you get a warning. This system has been operational along the West Coast in pilot mode for uh, several years now. And we have a number of pilot projects in the state of Oregon, including DWeb, ODOT, the University of Oregon, and other uh, places of higher ed. And our pilot partners get this de desktop user display. And for this particular one, it shows an earthquake that occurs off of Newport, where this epicenter is located. And it's for a person located in Coos Bay. We'll see if we have sound. Earthquake, earthquake, strong shaking. The yellow circle is the B wave. The red circle is the S wave. Earthquake, earthquake, strong shaking. Expected in 11 seconds. This is a test. Earthquake, earthquake, strong shaking. Expected in two seconds. So, this is a system that our pilot projects have been, uh, partners have been using over the past several years. And on their uh, desktops, they have uh, displays like this. And it's operated well. Uh, we still have to build out the system so it operates even better. And today, throughout uh, California, it'll be announced later today that uh, the earthquake early warning apps are late, available to the public throughout California. And I'll say something more about that in a few minutes. So what can you do with these alerts? The first thing is simply to move people to safety, to drop cover and hold on. And so. Uh, in the future, in Oregon, when Shake Alert is operative and you get an alert that an earthquake has occurred and you should expect shaking, the thing you ought to do is drop cover and hold on. There are a number of studies from previous earthquakes that show that people and casualties occur because they do stupid things when they're caught unaware. They start to run, uh, they end up being in the wrong location, they hurt themselves. And we can decrease that cost to society simply by having people drop cover and hold on. The second thing is automation. The BART system in California has been using ShakeAlert for years. Next time you're on BART and the train stops, it may be because they got a ShakeAlert. 
They want to stop the trains because they don't want them flying down the rails at 70 miles an hour when strong shaking runs. They want to use those trains after the event to take people out and bring things in. Uh, we have pilot projects with eWeb. Uh, they're looking at turning off the Carmen Smith power uh, generation facilities so the turbines stop spinning. Turbines are very large and expensive. There's not a spare one in the parking lot, so it'll be many months before they have another turbine available to them. So this morning it came on and it went off, and it does that every day because we wake up and use more power. So in the future, they could also shut it off for power generation. And just situational awareness for all the first responders who have to go out and respond to an earthquake. I'll finish off by saying something about the timeline and the build out of Shake Alert. Uh, this has been our path to Shake Alert. Uh, we've been working for quite a few number of years, and we've been working both at the science level, and also uh, C. Betsy Boyd, the audience, we've been working with our federal and state legislatures. We've worked across the state level, the federal level to lobby to be able to have the money to do this. So this has really been an all-hands effort across the campus of U of O and across the campus of UW, Caltech, Berkeley, and the USGS to find the funding for this. In the 2015 to 2018 time frame, uh, where we are right now is in 2018, limited public rollout. They have public alerts in LA uh, since earlier this year. I believe in one hour it will be announced in California. That there's public alerts throughout the state of California. And when the public alerting comes to the Pacific Northwest is still up for discussion. And our hope is that this time next year, in October of 2020, we can have uh, public alerts going out to the Pacific Northwest. But that depends upon working with our emergency managers in both states and the USGS to confirm that and allow that to be done. <coughs> so what is the call a time of big war? And get it started early, please. I love volcano. <laughs> I was with Professor Kennedy <laughs> this morning, head of seismic studies. Well, he was riding a plane outside. It was a great meeting with God. What does it have to do with data? Seismic, earth shaking, disruption, a lot of flows, fire in the mountains, a grateful dead coming to Oxford Stadium. This is what we're talking about here. <laughs> about safety and so if you if there's a reason physically that it is going to be unsafe for you to go under your desk or if it's going to be difficult for you to get up um, then just think about what you would be doing actually I'm going to talk about that fantastic <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, good morning thank you for having me here uh, I'm Lucy Jones I'm a Southern Californian and as you heard I have to take responsibility for all the things we're going to try to be crawling under tables uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, we actually, if you notice the original ShakeOut logo, it's the great Southern California ShakeOut. And we uh, created it uh, because we had created the ShakeOut drill. I mean, yeah, or excuse me, the ShakeOut scenario. So back when I was with the USGS, I led an effort to say, you know, we keep on talking about the probabilities of earthquakes, and our probabilities are a lot higher than yours, right? I was listening to you guys going, damn, that's pretty good, right? I don't get to buy a house and not worry about vaulting as the foundation. <laughs> First thing I do when I buy a house in Southern California is check and make sure uh, it's it's seismically safe. I've never spent more than $1,500 doing getting it as good as it can be, so uh, even with your lower probabilities, I would recommend it. But we also started people didn't listen. Just because cause, cause probabilities are the part of the pro problem we don't understand. We do not know when that next earthquake's going to be. I, when I came to, to Caltech in 1983, I, I worked for the USGS on campus at Caltech for my whole career. I was sure this earthquake, Big San Andreas earthquake, was happening before I left, before the end of my career. It was 300 years since the last earthquake, and the average time between them was 150 years. Of course, it's got to happen. Well, now it's 335 years and still don't have the earthquake, so we went and made it up. 
because we needed, we realized that when we were talking about the part of the problem we didn't understand, we didn't get people to look at the part that we do understand. And we know what the shaking is going to be. Part of doing this project was to create a model of what the shaking exactly would be like. Um, and I think there's some work to try to get this done, but we're able to do this because we have a really detailed understanding of the subsurface structure in Southern California. And that needs to be done to get the best possible model. What we're showing here is what the shaking was, is here's a map from the, Me the Mexican border runs here. This is sort of tilted on edge. And over here, we're looking over downtown Los Angeles. Here's downtown Pasadena's up over here. The Coliseum, so when you go to play USC, that's right down here. I've been talking for 60 seconds since the start of the earthquake, and the shaking's just barely starting to get into Los Angeles. So it's the same thing that Doug was talking about, about how long it takes, the wide area that's going to be involved, and we did people weren't understanding this. So we created this model, gave them fancy graphics to focus on, but we also took it through of exactly what the shaking was going to do to Southern California to get them to think about it. And we created this big model, and then we had to figure out how to get people to listen to us. And the first shakeout drill was intended to be the only shakeout drill, by the way. Uh, and it was to explain the results of this model and get people to focus. And we listened to the social scientists about how to get people to do things. Visual reinforcement is really important. Getting nice graphics like this gave you something to look at and, and comprehend. Doing the drill was a way to have people see other people getting ready for earthquakes. Because one of the big things from social science is that we do what we see other people doing. With visual reinforcement is really important. And we had to figure out how we were going to go about getting people to see that. And the drop cover hold on drill helped us figure that out. Um, I just thought since I'm here, I want to make the one comparison. As uh, Doug has shown, here's the expectation of shaking distribution for you on the same thing, and this is for Southern California. Our fault is about 200 miles long, this one is six, 700 miles long. So affecting a much larger area. This is Southern California, so we actually have more people in that area, you know, there's about 20 million people where this is gonna be uh, strongly shaken. But notice also the really strong shaking, intensities nine to 10, don't really show up here. Those are offshore. Your fault isn't where the people are. Right? In Southern California, we have the fault running through our backyards. And so um, it, it's a different picture. They're, and that's the, the important thing. And I think understanding what it is that you have coming and how to manage it, the stuff that Doug just all gave you is really important. But so here we are trying to figure out how to get 20 million people to notice this. And we created the shakeout drill and focused on drop cover hold on. These are actually posters we made up there 11 years ago. And we are all going to be doing drop cover hold on pretty soon. Um, and I wanted to spend a bit of time just explaining why. One aspect was it, it was visual. We could get people to see doing that. And let me tell you, having now, this will be my 12th year, climbing under a table in front of a lot of other people. <laughs> and one thing at least here, I don't have TV cameras today. I, you know, there's nothing like sticking your butt in the air in front of all the TV cameras to really make you uh, uh, wonder why you're doing this. Um, the reason we're doing it is because it really is the safer thing to do. Right? We actually, that summer, as we were creating the first shakeout, um, we, we, to try and get it going, we went out and talked to all the different counties, all the different emergency managers of the different counties of Southern California. And I, I went to Orange County. I was there with a guy from the Southern California Earthquake Center. And, you know, we were saying that we were doing this because it just, you know, it was hard to get people to focus on the problem because we hadn't had an earthquake recently. And, you know, so, you know, we just haven't had the earthquake and so people aren't thinking about it. And so we want to get folks about it. Literally two minutes after I said that, there was a magnitude five and a half, ten miles away. <laughs> Nothing like being in a room with emergency managers. But first, everyone looked at me because I had just said, it's been so long since we had an earthquake. <laughs> 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 and, and then everybody went under the table. It was really very impressive. We got, and by the way, just one other comment, nobody's phone would work. A room full of emergency managers and every cell phone can't get a signal because it's overloaded. When this earthquake happens, text don't talk. 
the texting will get through because texting takes a tiny bandwidth and can wait for a hole in the signal that lets it get through. To make a phone call, you have to grab bandwidth and hold on to it. And so text will go through when phone calls won't. Okay? Uh, we, we couldn't get, a, none of us could get a phone signal, and these were emergency managers with priority phones um, uh, for about two hours. Okay? Uh, the other thing is when we went and saw all the pictures on the news, we saw everybody in Southern California running outside because of the airport. And we realized that drop cover hold on only got talked about in schools. Half the people in Southern California didn't go to school in Southern California. Uh, and the other half, it might have been a pretty long time since they were in school and they weren't thinking about it anymore. So we realized that we really needed to get this message through the value of the visual reinforcement. So why do we say drop cover hold on? I know, that especially if you've got two minutes warning, couldn't we go outside? Mm -hmm. That's what people think. You think of this sort of image. This is from the Northridge earthquake. This is actually a floor that no longer exists. Right? You don't want to be there. That's how people die. You also can't get out in any sort of time at all. When buildings like this collapse, it happens quickly. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, we often think of, let me see how uh, here, but it. This sort of picture too, right? This is from the 1906 earthquake. But the reality is the buildings fall out. When you run outside, you are running to where those bricks are going. There's an incredible story. I don't know how I'm finding this. Um, there's an incredible story from uh, the Christchurch earthquake. Somebody who was sitting in a brick uh, coffee shop. The earthquake starts, he's right at the window. He thinks about running outside. He decided to drop and cover instead. And as he went under the table, he watched the side of the building collapse onto where he would have been. And in, in 2003, in the San Simeon earthquake in Paso Robles, um, uh, buildings had been spiffed up for modernization, but they hadn't been seismically retrofitted. And there was a building that was brick. The, Owner panicked or you know screamed, get outside to all of her, her uh, employees who ran outside and had the, the, the ceiling come down on top of them, and the two of them died. So when you think you want to get outside, you gotta think about what's happening outside. And if this building's collapsing, it's probably collapsing out. Okay? And mostly the buildings don't collapse. That's what our building code is designed for. By the way, it is not designed to give you a usable building. It is designed solely to make sure you can crawl out alive. What our real risk are is more from things like this, right? And you guys probably don't have regulations here about how you hook up ceilings. We finally do in California because of this. So this was a school room. We now don't allow that, but those sort of ceilings in schools. Um, but you know, there's lots of metal slats here. Those come flying around. What are they going to do to you? Running during that, as those are flying around, is more likely to put you in the path of them. Whereas being under a table, even these little pretty tiny things, really gives you some protection against this. Okay. Um, you know, when you do this, there are things that fall, even if you've got your whole building in place. Think of, uh, we've actually had people die from books falling on them. They tend to be a little bit of, there was a couple of older people with sort of an obsessive collection of books. But <laughs> enough books fall on you, it can kill you. Right? And even when the buildings do collapse, I have my favorite picture. I wish I had a better resolution. This is as big as I can get it. This is a school room in Mexico City. The building collapsed. The concrete floor came down. And those little spindly school desks held up the concrete floor. Right? By the way, have any of you heard about the Triangle of Life? Just a few, thank heavens. For those of you who've heard it, complete scam. And this is the earthquake that supposedly had all of those crushed school children. We have checked with Mexico City. The earthquake was at 7 in the morning. There were no schools in session. There was no schoolroom of crushed children. And in fact, this building was one of the ones that collapsed in the Mexico City earthquake. And you would have been really happy to be under those school desks. So this is why we do drop, cover, hold on. The, the other thing, we used to just say drop and cover. Um, the hold on literally became, as we realized, that, that desk is helping you protect you from all those things flying around, but it can move too. 
you know, uh, in 1987, we had an earthquake in, in LA. Um, that was when I was quite a bit younger. I had a one-year-old. I had a really good friend with a two-year-old and was nine months pregnant. And she grabs her two-year-old, goes under the dining room table, and the dining room table is on wheels. Oh. You know, I'm trying to hold the baby and the table uh, while she was nine months pregnant. It's always been one of my great images of what an earthquake would be like. Right? But it is um, absolutely the safest thing to do. And but the other thing is practicing it here. So I yes, we've got a couple more minutes still. It is about safety. This is basically our best assessment from people who really think about what earthquakes are of your best chance of what it is to do. If you are going to be injured getting under the table, that doesn't make any sense, right? So um, actually, I was thinking about this. My first shakeout, I was a lot closer to 15, 12 years ago than I am now, and I got sort of sore legs, and I'm, like, I'm probably going to have trouble getting back up again. I can still get down, though. Um, <laughs> uh, we do recommend that if you, if you can't get down safely, to just stay in a chair and cover yourself like this. Because the other thing, think about, we're talking about stuff flying around the room. That's the most likely thing to do. And we're going to be able to, uh, uh, it's, you're trying to protect the, day, you know, the more vulnerable parts of your body. The other thing is, uh, serve, you know, research has been done after like the Northridge earthquake. And the single largest category of injuries that showed up in the hospital were caused by people running. Sprained ankles, broken legs, and Glass in the feet, right? Because glass is going to be is very likely to be breaking. <coughs> it was in the middle of the night. People jumped out of bed and ran out and ran through the glass. Um, it's sort of crazy as you do this. Okay, it is ten seventeen, and we'll see when the warning comes through from. Uh, uh, right, I'm just getting on. So drop cover, hold on. Get to the floor first before the earth makes you there. Then crawl around to find a place under the table. You know, that takes a little longer. Oh, of course, my knees are sore. And now we're going to be shaking here. All right, let's think about this. You, if we had had a quick early morning, we would have now done this, and we wouldn't be feeling any shaking yet. All right? Because the shaking, we're going to potentially get a minute's warning here, depending on where that rupture starts. And the rupture is going to be going on for about five minutes. We are so far less than one minute through this event. And um, I want you to stay here at least for a couple of minutes. Oh, I just got my Southern California Shakeout Drill page from uh, coming in from Caltech. Have you guys gotten your page yet to Oregon? Okay. So the, again, you've got to worry about whether or not your system can handle all of this messaging going through. Um, if we're, uh, we're now a minute since we started this, so we can imagine that the shaking is getting quite a bit stronger. You know, Doug said count, so you have something else to do. We actually have, I've trained kids in California to do this because it's a really good way of reducing fear. If you're counting as it goes on, you are calculating how big the magnitude is, because it's the duration that scales with magnitude. And it literally does give you something else to do as you go on. But I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling old enough. I think we can call this off. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. Um, anybody feel ridiculous yet? <laughs> Let me guarantee that the fact of having done this is going to make it substantially more likely that you will behave safely when you do feel an earthquake. And that's really what the goal is here. Um, and oh, oh, one other, going to the doorway, that only came from the Red Cross. One old Red Cross worker in the 1952 earthquake saw an adobe house that had collapsed and the door frame was still standing. I'm like, wow, that must be a safe place to be. And the Red Cross started teaching go to the doorway. 
If you are in a 200 year old adobe house, it is the safest place to be. Anywhere else, it's not and it probably has a door. And it could be swinging around and hitting you. So we, we really don't say it. And say that's what I think we do. One thing, you know, here we are with the classroom of desks, we could do it. What if you're in a classroom that's only got those little side things on the edge of the thing? Well, crouching in place and potentially getting yourself down on the floor between the chairs is, is potentially a much safer place to DD. One of the scariest pictures I've ever seen, and I tried to find it for here, and I couldn't find it. It's from the 1989 earthquake, a classroom at UC Santa Cruz, where those upholstered seats, they, the classroom was empty when the earthquake happened. It was five in the evening. The ceiling, uh, these slats between the ceiling tiles had come down and were impaled in the upholstery. That's the type of thing that's much more likely to be doing injury and harm in these earthquakes than the collapse of the, of the buildings itself. So I'm about ready to hand it to Krista. Should I take a few questions here or should we? I think we should wait because Krista might answer some of them. So okay. Let's do Q&A after. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. I do have a quick clarification about what Rebecca said about me. I actually sleep really well at night. That's a good thing. You want me to sleep well at night? If I'm not sleeping well at night, then we have a problem. Um, so I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about what can you do to be prepared um, for earthquakes, but also a lot of what we'll talk about will be helpful in other types of disasters as well. Um, the little catchphrase that I wish that I coined, it turns out the Girl Scouts came up with it, is don't be scared, be prepared, right? If we practice, if we think about it ahead of time, we're going, to be, we're going to feel better about our ability to come through this particular event. Um, Doug talked a little bit about the or Oregon Resilience Plan. I want to show you a couple of statistics that he didn't go through already, which highlight the reason why we're going to talk about the preparedness things you need to think about at home. So part of what they did is they said, right now, how long would it take us to get 90% of our population back to having some of these critical services. So what they found was it could take one to three months for us to have electricity back in the valley. It could take one month to a year to have drinking water and sewer back um, in the valley. Our top priority highways could take six to 12 months. So those statistics are the reasons why we tell you we want you to have a two week kit with um, supplies that you need because it may be very difficult to get those things um, in the moment. Um, so I want to talk also a little bit about what we're doing here at the University of Oregon. Um, the first is that we have what we call an emergency operations plan and this spells out rules and responsibilities and how we respond to any type of disruption or disaster that could happen. Um, we have a series of hazard annexes. We've thought about things like communicable disease and active shooter and earthquake. Um, the other thing about this plan is it's very flexible. So while we may not have thought of everything, right, a meteor could land in the middle of the Memorial Quad, this plan is very flexible and we would figure it out. Um, a key component of that is what we call our incident management team. So we have a group of people on campus. Uh, we started in 2008 with about eight people and that's grown to be about 60 folks on campus. And that's people from communications, it's people from housing, it's people from the academic side, and they help us think through what are the problems we're facing in this particular moment and how do we solve those problems? What do we need to address? Um, if people were here in 2011, we had a, um, a transformer blow um, in the morning. We lost power to parts of campus, um, part of which was the residence halls. And we weren't really sure how long it was going to take us to get power back. So one of the things that team did is we sat down and said, okay, what are some options? It's going to be dark in our residence halls. Do we set up a shelter? What is it? What would that look like? What resources do we have? How do we provide security for that? How do we feed them in these other locations? What are some other options? And another option was, you know what? Their rooms have windows, so it's not going to be that dark. Let's get them all flashlights. <coughs> we went out and bought every flashlight that Lane County had to offer, and we were able to keep students safe in their rooms and still be able to do what they needed to do. So that's part of what this team does, really um, looking at problem solving. Um, and they would be engaged in an earthquake situation as well. Uh, from an earthquake standpoint, there is some focus on structural retrofits. So one of the great <coughs> things about our campus is it's a beautiful historic campus, but a lot of our buildings were built before we knew about the earthquake hazard. 
So our folks in design and construction are working on doing seismic retrofits to our unreinforced masonry buildings. Those are our beautiful brick buildings. Um, and a lot of those have been complete. Straub Hall has been done. Um, the um, Onset Gilbert Hall, Fenton Hall, those have all been retrofitted. And any of our major remodels that are happening, that, that's part of that process as well. So Bean Hall and the Residence Halls just went through a remodel and, and we added some seismic upgrades to that as well. And that will continue on as we work on additional buildings across campus. Um, some of the things that Lucy was just talking about um, are what we call non-structural. So structural is really about the bones of the building, right? How do we make sure the bones of the building are good? But there's also all this other stuff. Our AV equipment that hangs from the ceiling, our ceiling tiles. We can look at opportunities for what we call non-structural retrofits. How can we attach those things to make sure that they don't create these fall hazards for folks? As a department, you can look around your space um, a lot of us may have tall bookcases, maybe right by the exit from your office. You can put in a work ticket and have campus operations come out and attach some of that furniture so that it doesn't tip over um, in an earthquake that's available to you. Um, just like we did, we have been participating in the Great Oregon Shakeout um, for at least the last three or four years. So our fall test of our UO Alert system has a reminder to do that, and we will continue to participate um, as we move forward. Um, the other thing that we have, which is really cool, is a couple of years ago, um, we're part of a, a professional association of emergency managers in higher ed, and they said, you know what, um, it's nice for us to ask our city and county for help, but sometimes the help that we need is specific to higher ed. I need people who understand financial aid, right? The city of Eugene's emergency manager can't get me those resources. So we developed a mutual aid agreement among higher ed institutions, which says if one of us has a bad day, and we've signed on, we can reach out to those other schools and ask for help. So there are about 100 campuses across the country who have signed this. We have signed it. Um, and so one of the, the unique things that we're thinking about from an earthquake, earthquake perspective is trying to find some partners who have signed that who are outside of the earthquake zone. So University of Utah has signed this agreement. Um, one of the things we're interested in doing is identifying what are the things we know we're going to need right away and just say, you know what, University of Utah, when you hear this earthquake happens, we want you to start figuring out how to send us that stuff. Um, so that's a great resource. We are also um, working within the state to try and get all institutions of higher education to sign on to this agreement. Um, again, it can be helped for, it can be used for a, a bunch of things. If somebody has a communicable disease outbreak, if there's an active shooter on another campus, then we'd be able to send resources. Um, and in fact, we did that for Umpqua Community College back in 2015. Um, again, I think we've talked a lot about drop, cover, and hold. We did make a video. It's still available on our website. You can see the duck um, do that. Um, but we do sometimes say duck, cover, and hold, just because we can. Um, all right, so the next piece I want to talk about is thinking about supplies. So one of the things um, you can think about is having a, a smaller kit that you have available to you at work with just some real basic things that you might need if you need to find your way home, right? A couple bottles of water, some snacks. We heard this issue of, um, you know, having sturdy shoes. If I, I live about four miles from campus, so I could walk home if I needed to. The shoes I'm wearing today probably aren't the best choice for that. Um, so do you have some boots or some tennis shoes that you can keep with you? Flashlight, basic first aid kits. Um, just a, an idea to keep, um, you know, you carry it with you, have it in the front of your car if you drive, just really basic stuff to get you uh, between work and home. Um, we did a, an event a couple of years ago where zombie apocalypse, apocalypse was really cool, so we did this. It freaks me out. I don't like to look at that thing. But, um, <laughs> one of the things that we have, and we have them out on the back table, and I have more. One thing we recognize is if you sat here today and you go home and you're motivated to get your kit together, right? Depending on the size of your family, it can, it can be a lot of money to put that stuff together. Um, so this brochure gives you a shopping list so that every week you pick up three or four things. And over the course of several weeks, you'll get the things that you need for your kit. It makes it a little more manageable. It makes it a little more economic. Um, but some of the things to think about, again, we want you to have water a gallon of water per person per day. And again, the goal is that we want you to have at least two weeks. That includes pets too. So that can be challenging. Now, if you need 100 gallons of water, how do you store that? There's lots of resources online. Um, if you're an eWeb customer, they typically every year will do a, um, they give out three or five gallon jugs. And so that's a great opportunity to get a couple of those that you can stick in your garage and have some water available. 
We also want you to think about um, food, again, having non-perishable food. Um, I'll share a couple of tips of things that we do in our house. Um, I have a young daughter, she eats a lot of granola bars, right? So I go to Costco and I buy two boxes. And one goes in my kit and one goes in the pantry. And once we eat the one from the pantry, I take the one from the kit, I put it in the pantry, I buy a new one for the kit. Um, so oftentimes I think what people might do is you amass a bunch of food and you stick it in the garage and you never think about it again, right? And so then you end up with uh, maybe expired food in your kit. So thinking about how you can cycle that stuff through um, is really important. Other basic supplies, you know, a hand-cranked radio. How many people have radios that operate on batteries anymore? When we do this for students, they're like, what are you talking about? What is that? I don't know. <laughs> um, so that radio is going to likely be a good way to share communication out across the community. So having that is a good idea. First aid kits, um, personal hygiene products, toothpaste, deodorant. Um, garbage bags, uh, being able to shut off your utilities, especially if you have gas, um, sort of having tools ready by. Um, a can opener is really important if you've got a lot of canned foods. There's a real fun YouTube video out there that teaches you how to open a can by rubbing it on your driveway, so you can, there are other options. Um, but again, it's better to be prepared. Um, you see up there that I have a bullet about cash. So I'm terrible at this. I like my debit card, I use my debit card all the time, but I'm not gonna be able to go to Safeway and swipe my card and buy groceries in this scenario. So it's really important to think about having sort of a stash of cash and also thinking about having smaller bills. Because if you just need to buy some water, but all you have is a $50 bill, you might be spending 50 bucks to buy that water. Um, one of the things that we do, we have a fireproof safe. And so we have a little envelope, we keep some cash in there. Um, don't be like us because we will order a pizza and be like, oh crap, I need 20 bucks. And we go and steal it from the earthquake kit. Just make sure that you put it back. Um, similar to the shopping list, another thing to think about is just to get cash back at the grocery store every week. Five bucks, ten bucks, stick it in an envelope, don't use it to buy pizza. Um, but again, it's just one of those helpful things. Eventually, there'll be some trailers that show up with ATMs on them and we'll get those things in place, but really thinking about what do I think I'm gonna need to get me through those first two weeks? Um, thinking about having copies of insurance policies. Again, fireproof safes are really great. It helps you in earthquake, it helps you in other types of things. Um, having clothes, tennis shoes, that sort of thing. Um, another, I like to pick on myself in these stories, right? I grew up in California. My mom got an earthquake kit, put a bunch of stuff in a garbage can in the garage, and we never looked at it again. Then we moved to Oregon. I was probably in third grade when we put this kit together. We moved to Oregon. Now I'm in high school. We crack open the kit, right? We've got a bunch of uh, fruit cocktail and Vienna sausages that have botulism, <laughs> and a bunch of clothes that were never going to fit me if I had to wear them. So um, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is when you spend the time to put this kit together, maybe celebrate your birthday, right? Oh, it's my birthday. I'm going to open some presents. I'm going to eat some cake. I'm going to go check on my earthquake kit to make sure that I don't need to replace anything. Um, again, we've got tons of these brochures. Feel free to take those um, and share them with folks. The other thing I like to say, right, is it's, it can be daunting, but you might already have a lot of that stuff on your list in your house. Um, this is not my pantry. <laughs> not this organized. I wish that I was. Um, but look, at, there's a lot of stuff there that you can use. And so the other thing to think about is just where does that stuff live? Is it in a place that you could get to it? Thinking about sort of um, how you're storing your things and what you've already got that sets you on the way. Um, again, having a can opener is a great idea. Um, being in Oregon, we have a lot of people who like to camp, and we participate in outdoor activities, right? Also not my garage. <laughs> um, but when you look up here, there are things that could be really helpful from an emergency standpoint. I see some tents, some chairs, uh, some water. Those are like little water jugs, maybe two-gallon water jugs. Um, some fuel. So again, if you find that your home is damaged, maybe you have camping equipment or a trailer. Those are great alternatives. Um, to be able to, to use in those situations. Again, looking at what you already have. Um, a couple of notes I'll say too, um, for how many of you have gas barbecues at home? How many of you have more than one propane tank? Okay, that's good. Uh, we do the same thing with propane that we do with granola bars. I have a spare one so that if the earthquake happens to hit when my first one is fairly low, I can still boil water and I'll be able to cook some basic food um, outside. You can always do the same thing with camp stoves, but just kind of thinking about, do I have enough to get me through those first couple of weeks? Um, so those are kind of the basic things. 
Um, there's some other things to think about. Again, we sort of talked about thinking about your office. So I you know sometimes I say books aren't going to kill you, but I learned today that books might kill us. So that's <laughs> good to know. But again, a lot of us, especially faculty, have lots of books in our offices. So are there hazards that could be an issue here? I always think this guy is way too excited about the mess that's happening in his office. <laughs> but again, thinking about there are ways in which you can arrange your office, you can attach things, you can put lips on shelves to help prevent things from falling. Again, there, there's some injury potential, but it's also about cleanup time, right? So it's going to take some time to get this office back up and running and in a working order. So just kind of looking about and thinking about those things. Um, another thing is at home, your water heaters. Um, I believe code now requires these to be attached. If you have an older home, it might not be, but you can buy a kit if you're handy, um, and you can secure your water heater. And there's a couple of reasons you want to do this. Number one, if it's gas, it can create a fire hazard. Number two, there could be 30 or 40 gallons of water in there that could be usable as part of your emergency kit. So again, if storage is an issue, you might already have that. Um, my husband wants to get a tankless water heater. I'm like, no not doing it. <laughs> um, again, if you have gas at home, knowing how to shut that off. Um, I know a lot of people just keep the wrench right next to it, so you don't have to go digging through the garage to try and find that. You can get that taken care of really quickly. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, strapping your home to the foundation. Um, again, this is something you probably will contract out, and you just have to decide if that um, makes sense based on your situation and your um, financial situation as well, uh, but that is an option. The other thing that we saw a lot in the Nisqually earthquake were um, your chimneys, unreinforced chimneys falling, depending on where they are in your home, they can fall into your home. Um, and so you can have those retrofitted. If you've ever taken a walk down University between like 19th and 24th, actually a lot of those homes um, have had their chimneys retrofitted. Again, it'll cost a little bit of money. You kind of have to do that benefit cost analysis to say, do I think this is worth it for my home? Um, and check into that. Um, the other thing to think about is how do, what do I do with my family and my loved ones when this thing happens, right? Eugene, beautiful, we've got rivers, but when you look, we've got lots of bridges, lots of I-5 bridges. Your people might be all over in town. So one of the things to think about is if this happens during the day, what's our plan? Where are our people, right? So in my situation, I work over here. Uh, my spouse works across the river. We live across the river. I've got a kiddo that goes to school across the river. So what do I do if I'm stuck? right, on this side. Um, I'll, I'll have, have a mother who has a fairly small circle, so she stays on that side of the river, so her job is to go to the school and pick up my daughter. She knows that that's, that's her job. But thinking about maybe there's a neighbor who can also pick up your child from school if you're concerned about your ability to get home. Now, I do think there will be ways, <coughs> probably not the way that you're used to going, um, but the bridge that crosses I-5 on the Willamette River, that was recently re retrofitted. So if we're stuck on this side, that bridge should be fine. So I do believe we'll be able to get to other sides. It's just not probably going to be the way that you're used to. Um, the other thing that I like to say, too, is people are very creative, right? I think people get worried about this map, like, oh, my God, look at all these places. I'm not going to be able to get to. There will be a flotilla of kayaks to get people back and forth across the river. People will solve the problems, right? So I think that's really important to remember as well. Um, again, we also probably have lots of important documents that may come into play after an earthquake. If you've got any of this stuff, just make sure you're storing it in a safe spot all together. Um, one thing that we recommend here is to think about taking photos of all the stuff in your home, especially if you have um, like heirloom jewelry or things that are very kind of precious to you. Um, so you can say, yes, insurance man, I did have a 95-inch, you know, high-def 4K TV. Um, but just taking photos, putting them off, and sticking them uh, with your paperwork is a really good idea. Um, another issue that comes up sometimes is insurance. So this, I think, is becoming less and less available, especially as we see more earthquakes happening. Um, earthquakes are not covered by your standard homeowner's insurance. It's an additional policy that you need to purchase. Um, it is a choice that you have to make, again, weighing sort of the benefits and costs. Um, the deductible is typically 10 to 15% of your home's value. I'm not sure how accurate my annual cost is. I think it's probably much higher now. Um, but one of the things it can also do is provide coverage for temporary housing. So if your home is damaged and you need to be in a hotel or rent another um, place to live, 
that insurance can help cover that. Again, it's a personal choice you'll have to make based on your situation. Um, again, if you're leaving today like, wow, I don't want to just do the basics. I want to do so much more to be prepared, right? There's lots of other things, right? If you're a gardener, um, that's a great resource. If you know how to can food from your garden, that's even better. Um, my favorite thing up here is in the top left, right? Remember I said the sewer might not be working right away? So one of the things to think about is what are you going to do about that, right? I'm personally trying to convince my husband that I want a porta potty in my backyard all the time, like tomorrow. I want one. He's not buying it. But you have to have a plan for what you're going to do with that. Uh, my second favorite picture is bottom left, right? That's, there's a beer on a bike. So the point here is you want to be comfortable. If you like drinking a beer, have some beer. If you're a little kid, that's fine. Uh, the other thing is that bikes are going to be really great transportation resources during this event. It might be hard to get fuel for our cars. The only fuel you need for your bike is yourself. Uh, but if you're like me, where my bike is really only usable in the summertime, Maybe make sure that the tires aren't flat in the winter. Um, there's lots of cargo bikes around town. That's a great way to get stuff around. Um, so really thinking about what are some different transportation options, even if you don't use those things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and with that, I think I'll close it out and we'll open it up for questions. <laughs> This is a great talk. This is all of the things. A couple of things that have come up. One way to have supplies is to donate your earthquake kit to a food bank once a year. Mm -hmm. That's the way I do it. I've gotten some churches to do it that are already like supporting the food bank. So you you know you buy your kit. Uh, we used to do it all on shake and then all of this food showed up at the food bank all at the same time. So maybe get it on your birthday. Perfect here, it's not such a problem. Go buy a set of supplies that you know, to the fish, whatever it is that your family eats, some protein, some fruit, keep it for a year. A year from now, donate it to a food bank and um, do the other. The other one is about, um, uh, we changed what we're saying recently about uh, documents. Scan them and put them in a cloud storage or put them on a thumb drive on your on your key ring. Um, because a lot of what, if you end up in a refugee, <laughs> refugee uh, an uh, 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 evacuation center, um, uh, we've been doing this with wildfires. They provide computers for people at the evacuation center. So if you know, and now you know you have your insurance policy with you, and all of those things, and your birth certificate, and your marriage certificate, or your naturalization documents. Those might be things you really need if you're disrupted. And yeah, where do you store them? Store them in the safe. But if you put them on, if you scan them, it's a way to have it. I'm just going to say. Um, Building on this, she mentioned uh, evacuation centers for wildfires, so we know that's an issue for us. Uh, most of us also probably lived through Snowmageddon, where parts of town uh, didn't have electricity for five days. Apparently, Creswell didn't have uh, electricity for 11 days in some places. So you're not just preparing for an earthquake, you're preparing for something that actually happens here. Um, Ellen has a microphone. Uh, if you have a question, she, just wave your hand and she can help you. Is there any one way that to get on the table? Should you be sitting, should you be crouching? Do I notice that people are sitting in the front? Um, no, uh, it's it's how you get under there. You know, you're trying to protect your head, your your, your and your and your torso. You're trying to protect the important body body parts from flying objects uh, and the degree to be down. I mean, you also might be in a place without a table. Uh, I, you know, I've had it at home where, you know, hit with a real earthquake. I'm not gonna go run over to the dining room to find a table to be in. Going to an interior wall, that's getting away from glass is the other really important thing. And an interior wall is more likely to be a structural element and stay up. You see these pictures of buildings where the outside walls come off. So, um, no, it, it, there isn't a, a defined position, and, and I forgot to say that if you don't have a table, getting down, being small, covering your important body parts is really what you're going for. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story on myself with this. I did this once, I, we had an earthquake, 
I was with my four-year-old in the bathroom. He was brushing his teeth. I left the nine-month-old in front of a plate glass window. And the earthquake starts. And I did all the things. I ran <laughs> to go get that baby away from the window. Uh, and he actually wasn't there. I'd forgotten he'd started crawling the week before. And um, I screamed, where's me off? And my four-year-old goes, mommy, aren't we supposed to duck and cover? <laughs> I then pulled him up an interior wall and the earthquake stopped. Nothing happened, but anyway. Is there a safe elevation you need to be at in case of tsunami or to just depend on the terrain? Yeah, the mic, but you don't have to be that high up. Uh, you know, I would say 50 to 100 feet above uh, sea level um, would be adequate. So it's not on. Is it? I don't need it anyway. So uh, if you're at if you're at the coast and the earthquake occurs and uh, you're at relatively low elevation, try and get up 50 to 100 feet, and you'll be fine. I'll tell you, one of the world's most famous earthquake geologists, Clarence Allen, bought a house up here in Washington, and his requirement was the it needed to be at least 125 feet above sea level. He couldn't imagine anything that could get up to that. Uh, Addie has one. Oh, Addie. Addie, yay. I'm going to go back. Okay. No, don't go no, second. Um, what should we do if we're near the beach with our pets, or what should we do with our pets? OK, there's, you mean after the earthquake or during the earthquake? During the earthquake, uh, they will probably want to stay with you. And I probably hold on to them and make me feel better, right? Just to have the, the holding on. Um, they might very well feel the beginning of the, the earthquake that you might miss. So sometimes they react a few seconds beforehand. It's led to this sort of myth that earthquakes, that animals can predict earthquakes. It's really they're, they're functioning like early warning, they're feeling the beginning of it. So you might find that if they st suddenly start barking at you, maybe that's assuming it's a dog. Uh, <laughs> if cats start barking at you, it's going to be a more interesting thing. But uh, it might be part of the process of the beginning. Once, the, if you feel strong shaking at the beach, leave the beach. That's, I mean, it's like the downside you lost a day at the beach. The upside could be your life. And so, getting your pet, you know, if they need to be carried or if they can run with you. When you're near the ocean, you really want to get as high as you can. Uh, and most people think, you know, they've probably got 10 or 15 minutes before the tsunami comes in. Um, so it is time to get away if you move immediately. Often, though, you can't do it in a car. You can't drive away because the road's going parallel to the beach. You need to go up and make sure that you're heading away from it. Um, I was curious um, if you have information about our dams that are in this area. So I remember in the 90s, um, Hills Creek Reservoir around Oak Ridge was having repairs to on it because I think a crackhead occurred from an earthquake. Um, do you know if all the dams in this area have been, I guess, re Of course they haven't. They haven't been in California either. Our estimate is that we're going to have three dams that sent a shakeout earthquake will cause three dams to, to be so compromised that it will require emergency evacuation. That would be a problem here with flood too. Right, right. So the, the dams are probably more vulnerable to deep focus earthquake because that would be closer to them. Uh, the cascaded earthquake is far enough offshore that the shaking would be, if you saw the, the, the map there is removed towards the east in the cascades where many of the dams are, it's a lighter shaking. Uh, Historically, these types of dams have done pretty well in that type of shaping. However, the Army Corps of Engineers is reevaluating all the dams of Oregon. And uh, they are doing studies over the past couple of years, uh, drilling cores and examining them to uh, find out which ones are more vulnerable than others. So it's a, it's a problem that uh, you know, people are concerned about and uh, aware of, and it's, it's being looked at. But it, I, my sense is that uh, for the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, I would not expect a large number of those dams to go up. Uh, it's more deep focus events. I just want to add something about the tsunami as well. It's not just one wave. So I, we don't oftentimes say that enough is uh, once it comes in, they have a period of about 30 minutes to an hour or so, there can be multiple waves. So once you go up 100 feet and it recedes, don't think it's gone, stay there. Is it true that the uh, like dormant volcanoes like did not rate? Like, can they become active 
We have not seen an increase in volcanic eruptions connected to the subduction zone earthquakes. You know, those who are around the world look at what's going on in Japan and Chile. They have the big earthquakes, they have volcanoes, that's not the temporal correlation. The, the most significant cascading event is fire. So that's why if you're worried about an earthquake and what might be caused as a secondary event, think about fire, and that's why I think Chris to have the idea of having a wrench next to your gas meter and things like that. We actually have started recommending in California too to make sure you have a fire extinguisher and that anyone who stays home alone in your house knows how to use it. Because the issue with fire after earthquakes is that without with an overextended fire department, an event that you might have turned to the fire department they put out in a normal time, they won't be available to get to you, and then things get out of control. So anything you can do to stop a small fire from getting bigger in the immediate aftermath might be the difference of staying away from conflagrations. Um, I'm confused about whether or not it's necessary to strap your house down to the foundation, and then also, I mean, between the probability, but also, would the Eugene Building Code have um, required housing to be seismically sound no. at some point? I mean, like, is it, 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 does it depend on if you have an old house or a new house? Yeah, probably there wasn't a, I don't think that code came in Oregon until into the 80s or 90s. Um, and it's the difference of whether you want your house to be, it, a wood frame house falls off its foundation and it's not going to kill you, you just lose it. So it depends on whether you want to have a house after your quick. I can't imagine not getting it scrapped. So that's I couldn't tell from that. Is that wrong about the date though? Yeah, I'm not sure it applies to domestic homes. But you might still be able to build them without strapping now? Uh, I'll, I'll look into it, but I, you know, my house is, it does. When did it come into place? Late 90s, so the last 20 years only. Hey, um, well, I'm from LA and I've done like the whole earthquake thing a few times. And this summer with the bridge crest great quakes, I um, did the job cover and whole thing. And the first thing I did was call my parents after because they were actually out of town and across the country in New York. And the first thing they told me, because they lived in Northridge during the Northridge quakes, and so they were saying, prepare for the aftershocks and sure enough like that week I know there are a couple big ones and like thousands over there that we didn't feel in LA but I guess two-part question first is like you drop cover and hold and then how long should you stay there like should you stay under there preparing for an aftershock and then second like for how many days or weeks after like a big Cascadia quake do you think there would be aftershocks there are still aftershocks going on now to the 2011 Japanese magnitude 9. Um, a seven and a half in Kern County in 1952 had aftershocks into the 90s. Now, as the rate goes down, the chance of having a big one goes down, but that continues. The last magnitude five aftershock of the 94 Northridge earthquake was in 97. So it's years. They become, uh, immediately it's continuous, you have to be continuously moving. Um, how long you stay down uh, might depend on how scared you're feeling and what else you need to do and whether you're trying to get out. I, I've worked with schools on this issue and it's, um, it's challenging because they, well, we got to evacuate. And I'm going, all right, now that's right when the aftershocks are most likely. And, and why don't you not evacuate a school building in California? The school buildings are the safest buildings because of the field act. And they're like, oh, we can't do that. If the parents showed up and the kids were still in the building, they'd kill us. Uh, okay, so you have to evacuate. Well, how do you evacuate safely? There will be aftershocks in those first, that first hour. It might feel like it's never stopped moving. And so, you know, finding a safe place to be, take a few minutes there at the beginning, once the first round of shaking stop, I'm gonna stay here. We recommend, I go to preschools, if it's not raining, it's easier in Southern California, we get them to move the kids outside and spend the rest of the day outside. But you've got to do it in a safe way. The other thing is to remember that 5% of the time, the aftershock's bigger than the main shock. 
You could have a magnitude eight on the southern Cascadia and have it be a four shock to a nine. Uh, it happened in Chile in 1960, and an eight and a half turned out to be four shock. So uh, um, it's and it, it's, it's semantics. You know, and a four shock is a main shock that happened to have a really big aftershock, <laughs> and it's it's just all part of the distribution. And the bigger you're talking about, the less likely it becomes. But a few percent of the time, it happens. One thing to remember with the Ridgecrest earthquakes, they were a long ways away from LA, right? So what I can feel the 7.1 because I was taking a walk, right? Uh, when you're closer, it's a, it's a very different thing, but it's a very good point about aftershocks. It will be your reality for quite a while. Also, one of the things you see with the really big earthquakes like this, you are likely to have aftershocks. Crustal earthquakes triggered as aftershocks to the, the subduction zone earthquake. So I remember in, in Chile in 2010, they had an 8.8 .8 on the, the interface. And they had a magnitude 7 aftershock in a crustal zone very near a city, and much more damage happened from that aftershock. So depending on where you are with respect to the aftershock, it could be more, even though it's smaller, it could be more damaging to you. And we often see people killed in aftershocks because they're repairing the damage from the main shock. What's the EUO policy for keeping uh, students on campus or sending them home for the disaster? You guys, not me. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we have, I wouldn't say we have a specific policy. I think part of it is going to be situational, right? If we can safely keep them here, I think University of um, Christchurch in New Zealand was a really great example. They had a devastating earthquake. Um, they did not send their students home. Their students actually turned around and went and helped the community clean up afterwards. So right, right now today, we don't have a cut and dry answer to say we're going to try and send them all home or we're going to try and keep them. I think. Um, one thing that may be interesting is that, you know, I think we anticipate being in better shape than Portland. So a lot of our students who are from Portland may actually be better off here in Eugene than going home. Um, and so I think it's going to be a little bit of what's it look like? Is the airport open? Can we get kids out of here? Is there a way we can bus them over to Highway 97 and get them out? Or are we okay? Do we have food and water and shelter for them? And so maybe it makes sense for them to stay and we look at how do we get our academic pieces back up and running, whether that's in tents or um, in fields. There's a, if you're interested, there's a really great video um, for UC Northridge after their earthquake, and it talks about how they went through that process, and they did. They opened for classes two weeks afterwards, maybe, and they were in, like, this class. Economics 201 is meeting next to this tree over here. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're trying to be flexible and adaptable, because the challenge is we just we don't know what campus is going to look like when this happens. And so part of it is doing that assessment to say, gosh, if it's not safe for people to be here, then we need to put plans together to get them out of here. Or if it's looking good, then how can we use this? We've got 25,000 students who are here who can help our community clean up afterwards. So we're trying to be a little bit flexible with that. It's really going to depend on what it looks like. And Krista, I've heard you say before um, where, like those of us who are faculty and staff and uh, you know, might feel the need to find out information and pass that on to other folks. Let's say that our cell phones aren't working. How at U of O do we find out information and next steps? I think I might have changed my previous guidance on this thanks to some um, info from Lucy. So initially we were trying to say like, could we identify a location like the EMU amphitheater as the place? The challenge, like I said, is I have no idea what campus is going to look like. and. Um, I think our plan is that we will have physical places where people can go to get information, but I, I, I hesitate a little bit to say it's going to be this place because I just have no idea what that place is going to look like. And so I think we, we would encourage you to be as flexible and adaptable, but also make decisions for yourself in the moment and we want you to make the safest choice possible and that we may not have answers for you right away and so we are going to look to you to kind of make those choices of where you think it feels safe to be um, and I just it's it's hard to say and I know people want that they want the I want to come to this place at this time and these are all the things you're going to tell us um, and we're going to be working really hard on that I just I hesitate to give you all a place right now. 
Great. Well, thank you so much to our speakers, and also thank you, thank you to all of you for making time uh, to invest in, in this. So, thank you.